Welcome to Sheboygan County Government Working For You. My name is Adam Payne. I'm the Sheboygan County Administrative Coordinator and co-host of this program with Bill Gehring, County Board Chairman. And our guest today is Jim Riesenberg, the Veteran Services Officer. As many of you certainly are aware, Memorial Day is going to be soon upon us. And Jim today is going to discuss some of the roles and responsibilities of his department, as well as some of the uh, very important activities that are coming up. Jim, we've got nearly 10,000 veterans in Sheboygan County, and I know you're real busy this time of year. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your roles and responsibilities? Well, Adam, <clears throat> the, the Veteran Service Office system in Sheboygan County was in Wisconsin was established in 1934 in Fond du Lac County. In 1935, the Wisconsin statutes mandated that every county develop and put in place a County Veteran Service Office. Uh, the, Voyager 1080 of the uh, Sheboygan County Society of 40 Men and 8 Horses petitioned the county board to establish such an office and that action was taken by county board uh, activity in 1935. Uh, Catherine Holshue uh, retired in December of 1986 uh, and in January 21st of 1987 uh, I was elected to the position and it's been 16 years of a lot of challenge and a lot of fun. What's your office's mission and primary responsibilities? Our primary responsibility, uh, veterans benefits in Wisconsin are governed by Chapter 45. It basically said the veteran service officer uh, will assist all former military personnel, their survivors and dependents with access to programs for them and assist them with any trouble they may have accessing these programs. It covers several pages in the statute book, but that's it in about three lines. And uh, say it even more succinctly, and I know you've got a very good mission statement. Why don't you share that with our viewers? The mission statement is, is, is quite simple. We basically serve those who served. Uh, we do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, everybody uh, has their own problem or their own issue, uh, and our responsibility is to get that problem resolved uh, to the best of our ability and in a, in a manner that uh, is acceptable to them and, and is what they were looking for. Now to serve those who serve, we are going to have another completely new generation of veterans with, with the uh, terrorism and global war on terrorism in this country as, as well as across the world. Uh, what do you see as benefits or challenges in providing service to them in the, in the years ahead? Well, whenever, <clears throat> whenever, we, whenever we have a new armed conflict, it, it always seems that we have a new batch of veterans and a, and a whole new batch of, of uh, issues and concerns. Uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, which started the, uh, uh, and the Enduring Freedom, the started the global war on terrorism, has all been bushled up into something that the government is, has uh, called the global war on terrorism. And as far as the men and women who are serving now, uh, those who have gone before them and as the role of veteran, uh, will have, they'll have the same programs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in the 15 plus years that I've been doing this, uh, both the state <coughs> uh, veterans affairs and the federal VA have gone uh, to great lengths to change their programs to meet the changing needs of a changing veteran population. Obviously, the, the needs of today's veteran are far different from those of World War II and World War I. And along the way, I would say if we described education, uh, health care, uh, home loans and Department of Memorial Affairs, that basically would, would cover the, uh, the entire gamut of, of everything that's available. And <clears throat> both the state and the federal, if there are need for changes, uh, sometimes it takes uh, somebody with, uh, with a big political stick uh, to make some of these changes, but if there is enough uh, need for a change and enough demonstrated need for change, uh, changes come pretty rapidly when we can prove that there is a need for change. So. Uh, we look forward to the challenge of, of serving this new generation of veterans. So you mentioned education, uh, home loans, health care. I, I know there's a number of important programs that you provide. Can you give our viewers a little better flavor for what is available? Well, uh, everybody, with the, everybody, I say everybody, I mean the state and the federal, both have something in one of these programs. With the federal, probably the, the GI Bill is probably the single most uh, visible one. Uh, the state recently instituted the tuition and fees reimbursement for full-time 
uh, part-time reimbursement has been around uh, since 1935. And when you get into the, <coughs> the loan department, of course, the, the biggie is the primary mortgage home loan program. Uh, both the state and the federal have that. Under uh, health care, the, the, the federal VA, of course, was the VA medical system, the largest health care delivery system in the free world. And also, the, the state ha uh, has programs uh, for those who are down and out, grant programs for those who are extremely needy. And uh, as far as the Department of Memorial Affairs, well, the Memorial Affairs, the, the major uh, item there, of course, is the National Cemetery System uh, and the, the Military Funeral Honors Program that the state of Wisconsin offers, along with the, uh, the new veteran cemeteries at uh, Union Grove and at Spooner in northern Wisconsin, as well as the cemetery, the state veteran cemetery at the Wisconsin Veterans Home at King. So you mentioned the VA, and then you mentioned that there are a number of coordinated or overlapping responsibilities, whether it's at the federal level, the state level, and the local level here at the county. Uh, how do you go about coordinating those different programs and services? And again, if someone's interested in learning on what's available to them or their family member, what do they do? What are their first steps? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge to say the least. Uh, to What we try to do, the first thing we uh, try to do is find out what their needs are. And when we figure out what their needs are, then we try to find out what is best for them. But the, the easiest way to find out uh, as far as where to find help, as far as the VA is concerned, the old standby, the 800 number, is, is still in existence. It's been around for quite some time, the uh, 827 -1000. And that number, it doesn't make any difference where you live. If you live in New Jersey or Tennessee or Arizona or Hawaii or Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands, if you call the 827-1000 number, you'll find a veterans benefits counselor. And I don't think I'm going to surprise you if I say that we seem to live in a dot-com and a www world. And uh, the, the information is also available via the internet. And as new as it may seem, uh, the number of internet contacts uh, just seems like uh, about every week or so the, the contacts double. So. Uh, we know uh, not a lot of the older veterans uh, are probably computer literate, but uh, most of the newer ones are, and, and some of them even now contact, well, I read this on the website that my parents are in a nursing home and they might be eligible for something like this. So uh, a, great, uh, a great push and a great help in the outreach and in the public awareness effort. Uh, what if they want to contact your office? What number did they call then? 459-3053 or 459-3054. All right. And the good thing, if you go to the, to the internet or call the 800 numbers, uh, they will find out where you live and make the referral to our office. Because occasionally we find out and say, well, I called this 800 number and they said I should talk to you. So uh, it's, a, it's a great network of, of helping, helping veterans help themselves most of the time. And you mentioned the uh, internet or website in Sheboygan County a couple few years ago now has uh, implemented I think a very nice website. It's of course a work in progress but you've been very active with keeping that up to date and <laughs> keeping information on that. You mentioned if they don't have their own computer it certainly doesn't mean they couldn't go to the library or somewhere like that to access that information. You just want to touch on that briefly what you've done with the website? I think I've overloaded it. <laughs> I, uh, it has it has been uh, uh, it, it, it's just been tremendous. Uh, I managed to work my in, way up to probably about the third grade level in the school of computer technology. So and I'm I'm getting better at it. The county IT system uh, has been uh, has been exceptional in putting a lot of things on there for me. The important things, uh, starting January first, I knew enough about it that. When, uh, when I had a news release, uh, I quit faxing them. I said, anybody who wants to stay on the mailing list for news releases, uh, send me an email address or we'll never hear from you again. So now we have, I, I think, 14 or 15 where news releases go out. And the important things, I think if you look at it at the county website today and go to, to the Veterans Service Office website, you'll find, uh, you'll find the Memorial Day schedule. You'll find. Uh, uh, an, an open letter to all men and women on active duty regarding some of the things that they can be doing uh, before their last day of active duty. 
uh, information on vexillology. If you don't know anything about that, there's your chance to pick up on it. Uh, and just a myriad of things that some stay on the Webb County site for 30 days and then go to the Veterans Service Office page. And it's just, it's been a, a, tr a tremendous asset, not only in the public awareness, but in the outreach effort too. Well, very good. Mm -hmm. The last question I have before turning it over to Bill is earlier you mentioned that your mission statement is to serve those who served. Approximately how many veterans do we have in the county and how many are we serving? I said at the on the onset that it's approximately 10,000, but I imagine folks would be pretty interested in knowing how many we have and how many you're serving. I, I would be afraid to, to hazard an accurate guess because I'm not really sure. I think uh, the graph shows uh, roughly 10%. Uh, the graph is based on a 2,000 veteran population. So I would say the 10,000, between 10 and 11,000 would be a, a fairly realistic figure. Uh, it's really tough to put a handle on it. You know, I know we do lay to rest a couple of hundred every year, so that has an effect. And uh, the unique, I don't know if it's a unique thing, but one of the different things about the, the veteran population, we're getting older, but we're not getting younger. Uh, we probably will never create veterans uh, numbers in the millions like we did after World War II. So that number, those numbers are going down and if we lay a veteran to rest every 40 hours, we certainly don't welcome a new one back into the county every 40 hours. So uh, it is a declining figure, and I would say, if I said uh, 10,250, I probably would be within 100. Thanks, Jim. Hmm. As Adam said, vet uh, Memorial Day is almost here. Uh, Memorial Day is normally the beginning of summer, vacation time, things like that. Probably most people of my age and younger really don't know what Vet Memorial Day is all about. Can you tell me what Memorial Day means to you, Jim? Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> I would guess that first of all, that uh, it's supposed to be a day to remember those who, who fell on the field of battle, gave their lives on the field of battle. Uh, uh, it's uh, a day that I have a feeling that uh, succeeding generations are probably going to end up believing was create, created by an ad agency for a sale at the mall, or it was created by the Department of Tourism to say now tourist season is open, everybody can now go on vacation. And it's, it's a lot more than that. And I, I think people need to take a few minutes and probably refocus on just exactly what we are doing. I think the sad part of it is uh, nobody has the time to do that anymore. If you find a, an older cemetery you walk through there and, and you see uh, someone who was 20 years old that died in November of 1917 or uh, June of 1944 or October of 1951 or November of 1967 and they're in that 20 year age group, they probably lost their life on the field of battle. You know, if you look at somebody and you see somebody who's 20 years old or 19 years old and he died June 6, 1944, he probably lost his life at Normandy. And then you, you stop and think, what would have happened uh, had, had uh, somebody else won at Gettysburg? Or had the Normandy invasion failed? Where would we be today? Or if that, if that person were uh, 18 in 1944, what would he be doing today? How would life be for him? You know, the, the sad part of Memorial Day and its counterpart, Veterans Day, that I think the, the true meaning of the day is probably lost uh, even before the, the, the gunpowder from the rifle volley has drifted out of the air and uh, the echo of taps that hasn't stopped reverberating. And I think most people have forgotten what we're supposed to be doing today. And that's the sad part of it, and I don't know how to change it. There are several Memorial Day activities going around throughout the county. You'll be involved in some. Can you talk about some of those activities? Uh, I, I will be involved. Uh, as far as planning, I'm not really too involved in that. We do get calls on... Uh, on protocol or flag etiquette or history or things like that. Uh, I belong to the Vietnam Veterans of America group here in Sheboygan and I'll march with their honor guard and I will be speaking out at Ryan Center this year for their program. But there are programs uh, in just about every community uh, in the area and I think uh, I've asked and some of them are now posted on the county website and uh, I'm putting them up there as, as they come in and I think I would encourage everyone to kind of keep an eye on the local media and, uh, and, uh, and find, find some time to go out and participate in at least one of them. 
Okay. Placing flags on veterans' graves seems to be one of the major things that is done right before Veterans Day. Can you tell us roughly how many flags are placed in some of that background? That's a challenge. <laughs> we're, we're, as we're taping this, the, uh, the organizations, we will probably uh, place about uh, 10, almost 10,000 flags in the 108 cemeteries in Sheboygan County this year. We've got uh, 26 veterans organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, they, uh, uh, several years ago, the late Al Sterling uh, laid out a map. He put a peg out for every cemetery where they were, put another peg down for every veterans organization. He said, this is how we're going to do it. And it works out quite well. Instead of one, one or two groups doing 15 or 18 cemeteries, everybody uh, has a share. Uh, and if you like, for instance, uh, down in the, uh, in the Hingham in the southeastern corner of the state, uh, American Legion and, and Cedar Grove, Oostburg, and Hingham take care of the cemeteries in their area. And down around Random Lake, uh, the Random Lake Legion and the Random Lake VFW. And if you go further west uh, in the town of Scott, out in that area, uh, the American Legion in Adel, the American Legion in Triangle B in Boltonville, they take care of that. And then up around Elkhart Lake, the uh, Elkhart Lake uh, VFW, there's uh, American Legion in Greenbush and Glen Beulah, so those areas are covered. And then over in the northwest corner of the state, uh, at the county rather, uh, the Howard's Grove VFW and the uh, Franklin American Legion. And here in, she in the city of Sheboygan, uh, the, uh, there's nine organizations and they pretty well, the, the larger cemeteries like uh, Calvary and, and Lutheran, <coughs> excuse me, and, and Wildwood, uh, that's usually a job for a couple of organizations because uh, there's, I think there's <coughs> well over a thousand in both of those cemeteries and they are the two largest ones. And then we have one cemetery at Elkhart Lake, the Sharp Cemetery, uh, one veteran, Private Edwin Sharp, Civil War. So, and the organizations have been, have been really good about that. They pick up the flags. The county board has been really good about providing money to purchase the flags and the flag holders. And, and it gets to be a rush in the next couple of days. I would expect uh, probably uh, by Friday or Saturday, uh, most all of the flags will be placed. Okay. You mentioned that there are roughly 26 veterans organizations <coughs> in the county. What might be the benefits for a veteran to join one of those organizations? Well. I don't know. I would venture to say that if you asked 100 veterans why they joined, you'd probably get 100 different answers. Uh, some of them joined just as to see it as a continuation of their service to the community, state, and nation as a takeoff from their military service. Uh, some joined to, to pr provide support for the uh, programs that have been designed and built for veterans, because veterans organizations uh, have long been the lobbyists and the leaders uh, in developing and maintaining these programs. And some of them join just uh, for the camaraderie that's associated with the military way of life. You know, if somebody says, the smoking lamp was lit, uh, you know, if, if you didn't know what it meant, you'd wonder what they were talking about, you know, and those kinds of things. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things that happen uh, in our community, uh, in our county, in our state, and in the world that probably wouldn't happen if it weren't for veterans organizations. Are there different requirements for being able to join the different organizations? Uh, most of them, all of the veterans organizations uh, have a federal charter. Federal charter uh, affords them some special tax incentives. Uh, in return, they have to ensure that every member of the organization meets the, the, uh, the guidelines as set forth in their charter. Uh, for instance, uh, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, uh, you would need to have and be combat wounded and have been awarded the Purple Heart in order to be a qualifying member. So if you don't have it, don't even think about asking to join. Uh, veterans of foreign wars, uh, you need to have served on, a, uh, on, for, in, on foreign soil during a period of conflict and have one of the prescribed uh, combat or participation service medals. Uh, disabled American veterans, obviously, you need to be a disabled veteran, a service disabled veteran in order to join. So yeah, they all have, and a lot of them are pretty strict about uh, you know, what the membership requirements are. The American Legion merely requires uh, active, do honorable active service during a, a period of armed conflict. Uh, and uh, Vietnam Veterans of America uh, service uh, during the 1961 to 1975, I believe, when it ended. So yeah, they all have requirements and they, and, and they all uh, enforce them. 
we do get uh, calls quite often from the membership adjutant. Uh, this veteran wants to join our group, send him a copy of his service record so we can find out if he's qualified. Mm -hmm. so, and, and it's uh, uh, aggravating to some people that, you know, they uh, want to participate but can't, but uh, there are, I think, 56 or 58 federally chartered veterans organizations, so there's one out there for every veteran. Okay. We've talked a little bit about the number of veterans decreasing. Uh, Memorial Day really is an important day to remember the sacrifice that our veterans have made. What do you think we can do? How can we best preserve Memorial Day? Well, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I would think the, the best way that you can say thank you is probably uh, try to be a good citizen. You know, uh, probably sound like old hat, but you know, uh, do the right thing. You know, uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with uh, not breaking the law, I don't think. I think a whole lot of people would be a lot happier. But you know, other than uh, if you have the time and you want to volunteer your services at some place like uh, at a nursing home or uh, at the Wisconsin Veterans Home or down at the VA hospital, there's always a need for uh, people. You know, I think at, I think just at the at the King Veterans Home last year, uh, 78,000 volunteer hours. That's a lot. That's a lot of hours for people to volunteer, and there, there are probably uh, individual veterans who would things like transportation to a hospital or transportation here or there, things like that. But I think overall, for the uh, for the majority of the people, probably the best way thing to do is uh, make sure that we don't fritter away the thing that these things that specifically the way of life that these men fought for and some of them died for, men and women. So it's, a, it's a big world out there. It's a tough world out there, but I think uh, each one of us individually could try and make it a little better so their sacrifice will not have been in vain. Thank you. Good advice, Jim. One of the smaller departments that we have in Sheboygan County, we've got 23 departments and uh, veteran service offices, one of the smallest with two employees, one of the uh, one of the areas we haven't touched on is the Veteran Service Commission. Why don't you briefly tell our viewers the role and responsibility of the commission? The Veteran Service Commission also exists by, by statute. Uh, and the primary mission of the Veteran Service Commission, everybody gets down on their luck once in a while. And, and the primary role of the Veteran Service Commission is to provide temporary financial assistance uh, to qualifying applicants. The qualifying applicant would be the same as it would be if they were going to uh, apply for a state or federal uh, veterans benefit. And the, our commission, and, and each county has a commission, each county operates uh, uh, in its own. Uh, every county does what they feel is best for their area. And in Sheboygan County, uh, the uh, temporary assistance, uh, three months in a calendar year for the basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter. Okay. Uh, uh, we've done a lot uh, with the commission over the years, uh, and it's just uh, another one of those things that uh, uh, veterans usually don't find out about and, until they've just about hit bottom in their personal life and when they come to see us. Uh, we, ha we have, a, I usually try to explain to people that we, are, are, we have a three-tier setup here. If your condition is strictly temporary and the commission can help you, and that's the end of it. That's short term. That's three months. If you're if you're temporary and it's long term, going to be more than three months. Well, then we then we have the state grant programs that we can work on. And if it looks like it's going to be long term and probably a permanent issue, then we'll go to the federal programs. Uh, and federal programs do take a, a long time. And if we can if we can get somebody started, uh, get them help them a little bit, at least get back on level ground with the commission. Uh, we can get a grant application started through the state if they qualify, and, and we're moving up just a little bit, and if, if something that we can do as far as the federal VA and get them a long-term program, uh, then we'll have this whole, uh, the, the whole operation will probably take nine to ten months. But uh, we've done something to help somebody, and uh, it gets to be a long and aggravating process, but uh, we do the best we can. The, the most frustrating part of all of this is waiting. You know, and I think we've probably all been in that situation. And, and then all of a sudden, when you're down on your luck and everything is going against you, uh, the wait is even longer. What seemingly you say, well, it's, it's probably only going to take three months. 
Well, <laughs> three months to somebody who's down on the luck is, is, could be a lifetime. But the frustrating part of most of the federal programs is as people get so aggravated, uh, they walk away from it because they don't want to deal with it. You know, so. Having had the pleasure to work with Jim now for a little better than four years, certainly if you're in need of assistance or more information, I strongly encourage you to, to call the VA number that was on your screen earlier or to contact Jim's office because Jim certainly, I know, has gone above and beyond the call of duty in the past and will so in the future to help people get the assistance and information that they need and we appreciate the work that you've done with us and for us, Jim. No problem. We only have a couple of minutes remaining. As you think about the year ahead, is there a key goal or a key uh, objective that you're looking to achieve or work toward? <laughs> Send money. <laughs> uh, I think as, 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 we, as we work our way through this budget year and this calendar year and, and look ahead to 2004, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a secret that we're probably all going to have to try to do as much or more with less. And uh, I don't really see that as, as a great problem. What we've done specifically in the office, uh, we will be putting in, uh, hopefully uh, this year yet, the uh, Veterans Information Management System to uh, increase our overall efficiency uh, and uh, that type of thing. That, if we get that in, that's going to help a little bit. Uh, another goal, uh, and this has been an ongoing goal since 1987, to be able to continue to provide uh, service to our clients in a, in a, in a compassionate and, and professional manner. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for being our guest today, and thank you for joining us next month. Our guest will be Dean Ray Hernandez, who's going to talk about many of the improvements that are occurring out here at UW Sheboygan, whether it's nearly $1.8 million in infrastructure improvements or the new science edition that Bill Gehring and others just broke ground for recently. Uh, there's some exciting occurrences out here, and we hope you'll joy, join us then. Until then, I hope you'll have a chance to think a little bit about upcoming Memorial Day and perhaps participate in one of the activities. And if not, whether it's saying thank you to a veteran or dropping a note, or as Jim said, just being a good citizen, uh, God bless and thanks for joining us. You know, it doesn't even matter what I think or what I believe, you can't be heard. The whole system, it's rigged from top to bottom. An honest voice in politics, there's no chance of that. At least that's what I used to think about politics. I can make a difference. The system works best when we're all involved. The Youth Leadership Initiative prepares young men and women for their roles as American citizens. Pairing technology with education, the Youth Leadership Initiative captures the attention of our nation's youngest citizens and leads them into the democratic process. Together with local schools, YLI offers internet-based projects that complement classroom instruction and foster long-term participation. I'm a member of my community. I'm a parent and a grandmother. How can we help? Bring the free civic education resources of the Youth Leadership Initiative to your schools today. Call now for a free information packet and to receive this Presidents of Our Country ruler. Together, we can pass the torch to the next generation.